Good evening. Good evening. I think we'll uh, we'll get started again. Uh, the uh, the panelists will be uh, will be coming up to the stage and introduced after our keynote speaker. So, my name is Shane Turner. I'm a, currently a member of the Waterloo Region Crime Prevention Council, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. And after reading his impressive bio, I realized with Chris in the uh, in the room, I have to make sure that I stay on script. So. Uh, Howard Sapers was appointed Correctional Investigator of Canada in 2004. Previously, Mr. Sapers has been the Executive Director of the John Howard Society of Alberta, an elect elected member of the Legislative Assembly of, of Alberta, the Director of the National Crime Prevention Centre Investment Fund, and Vice Chairperson for the Prairie Region of the Parole Board of Canada. Currently, Mr. Sapers serves as a North American Region Member of the International Ombudsman Institute Board of Directors and a member of the Board of Directors for the Forum of Canadian Ombudsmen. Mr. Sapers represents the government of small, federation, small federal departments and agencies on the Government of Canada Small Department Audit Committee and is the Chairman of the Department of National Defence and Canadian Forces Ombudsman Advisory Committee. Mr. Sapers is also an adjunct professor at Simon Fraser U University School of Criminology. And on a side note, uh, an interesting side note, uh, you heard earlier this evening that our uh, Crime Prevention Council staff moved offices from the uh, Re uh, Regina Street location to just, uh, just across the way. And of course, when you're, uh, when you're cleaning out offices and packing, you come across all sorts of uh, memorabilia and interesting little tidbits like old pictures of uh, men with big mustaches and plaid pants and all that sort of stuff. But the staff, when they were going through the research library, they came across a report that was published in June of 1991 entitled Family Violence Breaking the Cycle. And it was a report that was commissioned by the Mayor's Task Force on Safe Cities and the Family Violence uh, Committee. And again, published in June of 1991. So when you look at the, um, the uh, Mayor's Task Force membership, Howard Sapers' name is listed as the Vice Chair. So clearly Mr. Sapers has been an advocate of uh, crime prevention before crime prevention is what we know of it uh, in our country now. It's certainly our pleasure and our honor to have him here in Waterloo Region tonight. It's our pleasure and our honor to, uh, uh, to see the, the diligent work that he does as a correctional investigator. And it's certainly just, it's our honor to have him on our side and in our corner in terms of crime prevention. So please welcome Mr. Howard Sapers. Thank you. Thanks. I, w I was looking down here because that's where my notes were, but there, somebody put them on the table. I was afraid I was going to have to sing or something. So, Is, okay, it's not it's not going to keep on humming like that. Okay. Um, good evening, and thank you all for uh, such a wonderful welcome. I, I usually come into uh, this part of the province to go to prison and um, I do my time and I get to go home and I've hardly ever stayed and that's been a big mistake. Um, I've had a wonderful reception. Um, I've had to work a little for the lunch that I was provided, uh, but no complaints whatsoever. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here and, and um, that's in spite of the fact that re-watching Andrew Gregg's documentary um, made me angry. Um, <laughs> you know, you forget about these, uh, about these things sometimes. It, it sometimes is, is a bit of a blur. Um, I'm going to uh, spend uh, maybe 25 or 30 minutes sharing some thoughts with you. Um, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. And I think it's going to be a really interesting evening and a terrific conclusion to what's been a very uh, intellectually challenging and stimulating day for me. So, um, uh, uh, Christian, you're um, uh, terrific. So thank you for, for this. I want to start by saying um, when Juanita called me uh, or sent me a, an email and suggesting that I could participate in this session, I didn't realize a couple of things. I didn't realize, one, that be, there would be so much pressure on me to do a good job. Um, you know, I didn't know that this was the launch of a new series that's compared to 92Y. I mean, <laughs> and I'm the inaugural speaker. You think that's not pressure, then, you know, you're not paying attention. 
Um, when I was first elected to the Alberta legislature, on the very first day of the very first session, um, I, I was assigned the task of asking a question to the then Premier of Alberta, Ralph Klein, in my very first question period. And, um, you know, so the speaker was introducing people during the question period, and it got to be my, it was like that was the third question, which is, you know, that's pretty good. Um, pretty impressive. You should be more impressed with that. <laughs> and just as I was about to stand up to ask my question, a page came over to me. You know, the pages, they, they bring notes and they bring glasses of water. And, you know. So a page came over to me and tapped me on the shoulder. I said, excuse me, Mr. Sapers. And, I went, yes. and he handed me a little note that had been neatly folded. And, I, and I, the speaker was in the process of, of saying, and then the next question from the honorable member. And so I looked at this note, and it was from my house leader. And I opened it up, and all it said is, don't screw up. Um, and that's very much how I'm feeling tonight. <laughs> so um, we're going to pretend this is all going to go well, and that'll be our story um, going, going forward. Um, the other thing that was interesting about the invitation when I received it is that it came on the heels of me being told that I wasn't going to be reappointed as correctional investigator. And, and so... Um, that was, that's fine, that's the government's prerogative. But I, I answered back saying, you know, I would love to come to the Kitchener Public Library and do this uh, presentation, but I may not be the Correctional Investigator of Canada. So, you know, if you want the Correctional Investigator of Canada, I can put this invitation into a special file for the person who will replace me, and they will consider the invitation. And, and you know, it was really nice, the note that I got back, which was, no, we'd kind of like to hear from you. Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, if you're not the Correctional Investigator of Canada, you can talk about what that was like. Um, and I can still talk about what that's like, because um, I was reappointed for one year, uh, the term ending March 31st, 2016, or until I'm replaced. Uh, but then I conspired with the Governor General of Canada to have an election called. You thought it was Prime Minister Harper, but it was, it was me and the GG. And, um, and so that, that has meant that uh, during this writ period, which is mercifully very, very long for me, um, they won't be replacing me. And then I get to re-up with the new, uh, the, the new government, uh, whoever that may be, and we'll see what happens in the future. So for the time being, it's business as usual for me and my office, and Canadians are still very well served by a professional and dedicated uh, group of public servants that provide, I think, outstanding and robust oversight of Canada's corrections. And I am very uh, proud of the work of the men and women in my office, and, and it really is uh, a tribute to them um, that our work gets the recognition that it does. Um, now, as I begin uh, my remarks, I also think it's very important to acknowledge um, the important but often undervalued role that an organization like the Waterloo Regional Crime Prevention Council plays. Um, it's not just in terms of crime prevention, it's also in terms of supporting safe return and resettlement, building welcoming communities as well as safe and healthy communities. I'm especially grateful to be here to witness firsthand how the Waterloo Council has flourished through the many years of its operations, uh, remaining committed to pursuing crime prevention through social development activities. Uh, in a former role, as you heard, I was once the director of the investment fund for the National Crime Prevention Center. And if my memory is correct, um, I was there when the Safe and Sound Initiative was renewed. And um, that was then sponsored by what was known as the Waterloo Region Community Safety and Crime Prevention Council. Thank goodness you made your name so much easier to remember and say. Um, but that Safe and Sound project was one of the uh, early uh, demonstrations of success for the concepts behind the National Crime Prevention Center. So congratulations uh, for your perseverance and for your continuing success. Um, now, commercial message, I want to tell you a little bit about what my office does. I want to make sure that you're familiar with 
what the Office of the Correctional Investigator is. It's been around since 1973. It's been enshrined in legislation since 1992. Um, but even some parliamentarians that I've met over the years, in spite of the fact that we table an annual report, which means you know once a year, so over all of those years, every parliamentarian has received at least one report from my office. I'm amazed still when I meet with some senators or members of parliament, they'll say, wow, it's so good that this office has been around. When did you guys get started? And uh, anyway, that's another story. Um, so as correctional investigator, I serve as an ombudsman for federally sentenced, correct, uh, federally sentenced offenders. So that's all the offenders that are serving a sentence of more than two years. Uh, we conduct investigations into the problems that offenders present to us, but also related to any act, decision, um, or, or, or activity of the Correctional Service of Canada, as well as we conduct systemic investigations um, looking at policy issues. And we make our recommendations uh, to the Correctional Service directly to redress maladministration or the problems that we uncover if the investigations, in fact, lead to conclusions uh, or findings that uh, need to be addressed or we make recommendations directly to Parliament through, um, through annual reports. It's important to remind you that I am fully independent of the government, of the minister, and of the Commissioner of Corrections. The office is um, a separate employer, and it's a small agency, and uh, we, we are um, uh, relatively unfettered. And the office has not been interfered with in terms of the discharge of its mandate. And that's a good thing because it would be illegal if anybody did. It's actually in the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. And so that's kind of nice. Um, I have um, subpoena powers and I have powers to convene public hearings. Um, and of course, um, the nicest thing is that I am legally incompetent. Um, in case you're wondering what that means, it means I cannot be compelled to give expert testimony. Again, to maintain the neutrality and the independence of the office, I can't be brought into court on somebody's behalf to talk about something. So um, it's nice to be legally incompetent. <laughs> it allows you uh, to excuse many behaviors in public. Um, the office is embedded in the same legislation, the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. That is also the governing law for the Correctional Service of Canada and the Pro Board of Canada. So we are very much um, part of the rule of law. Um, the, the office is not an advocacy body. We don't take sides. We look for fairness. Uh, we look for compliance. We look for legality. Um, we are essentially a human rights organization. We use that lens as we do our work. Um, impartiality and independence, these are the principles that are protected in law and they're the source of our office's influence with parliamentarians and the public. The uh, OCI is a very small agency, 35 full-time staff with a budget of about $4 million. Uh, my staff have full and unfettered access to all federal correctional facilities, their staff, their documents, um, and of course, to offenders. My staff regularly visit federal institutions across the country. Uh, they meet with both offenders and correctional staff. Last fiscal year, Together, the staff spent almost 400 days visiting prisons. Um, they conducted more than 2,100 interviews during those visits. We also reviewed over 1,500 use of force files, which are usually accompanied with video. So imagine if that was your job, sitting in a small dark room, looking at a video monitor, looking at um, handheld video of use of force interventions. Um, and I have a small specialized staff that does that every day. They also reviewed 167 deaths in custody, assaults, and incidents resulting in a serious bodily injury. So it's a very heavy and demanding workload for a small group of people. As the documentary that we've just watched suggests, we have reached some very important crossroads in how we respond to the problems of crime and offending. Simply locking up more of our citizens for longer periods of time only to release them with little or no assistance is not a recipe for increased public safety. It seems uh, somewhat paradoxical to me that at the same time that national crime rates have fallen, in some cases to historic lows, the federal prison population has increased. In the 10-year period between 2004 
in 2014, the total Canadian federal incarcerated population grew by just over 2,200 inmates, representing an overall increase of 17.5%. Most of this growth over the past decade can be attributed to steady increases in incarcerated populations of Aboriginal people, visible minorities, and women. And most of the growth within those categories is not the result of new admissions to custody, that accounts to a little bit of the increase, but most of the increase comes from the stacking effect of more people staying longer in prison, getting longer sentences to begin with, and then staying longer before their first release. In the last 10 years, the Aboriginal incarcerated population increased by 53.8%. Aboriginal people now represent almost a quarter of all federally incarcerated individuals. And remember, Aboriginal Canadians represent about 4.3% of our community, but nearly 25% of our prison population. Visible minority inmates, including Black, Hispanic, Asian, East Asian individuals, increased by 95%, almost doubled over that 10 years. Nearly 10%, one in 10 of federally incarcerated offenders is black, yet black Canadians account for about 3% of Canadian society. Federally sentenced female population increased by 77%, with the Aboriginal women population increasing by a staggering 133% over that 10 years. Today, over a third of all federal women behind bars are of Aboriginal heritage. The profile of, in, of individuals behind bars in Canada is changing. If prison reflects society, then the impact of larger demographic and socioeconomic trends, as well as legislative and policy reforms, are changing who is imprisoned, for how long, and why. Today, one in four federal inmates is 50 years of age or older. The population of aging or older people behind bars has risen dramatically, increasing by nearly one-third in just the last five years. It's the result of the combined demographic effect of a population in general that's aging, but also offenders staying longer in prison before release and the accumulation of longer serving indeterminate or life sentenced offenders. Today, in fact, one in four, one in four of federally sentenced offenders in federal institutions are serving a life sentence. The average level of educational attainment upon admission to a federal penitentiary remains low. More than 60% of offenders at intake have an identified education need. This means that they have not graduated from high school. Last fiscal year, 61% of those assessed with an education need had grade eight or less. Approximately 60% of offenders have employment needs identified at intake. Before prison, most are chronically under or unemployed. Four in 10 male offenders require a uh, further assessment at admission to determine if they have a, a mental health need that requires intervention. 30% of women offenders coming into a federal penitentiary have a previous uh, history of psychiatric hospitalization. Six in 10 incarcerated women today are taking a psychotropic medication while they are in custody. Close to 70% of federally sentenced women report histories of sexual abuse, and 86% have been physically abused at some point in their life. You cannot separate their life history of trauma from their conflict with the law. Addiction or substance abuse issues plague 80% of male offenders. In fact, two-thirds of all federal offenders were under the influence of an intoxicant when they committed their index offense. This changing profile of risk and need stretches our conventional understanding of what prisons are or what social purposes they are supposed to serve. What makes this environment even more challenging for those managing or overseeing prisons is the context in which these changes have occurred. Matters of crime and punishment have never before been thrust so directly into the forefront 
of public discourse, but this discourse is often being pursued without balance or facts. Pushed to address more complex needs, the components of our criminal justice system, uh, police, courts, corrections, parole, probation, are all struggling to keep pace. The system has become increasingly costly to operate. Overall spending on the criminal justice system at the federal, provincial, and municipal territorial levels was over $21 billion in fiscal year ending 2014. We spent more than $12 billion on policing costs alone that year. Total criminal justice costs have risen by almost 25%. Coincidentally, that's very close to the drop in the crime rate of 23% over the same time period. We have to ask ourselves what it is exactly that we're buying with all this money. What are we getting for that level of spending? Well, today, more people are in detention, pretrial custody, remand, awaiting trial or sentencing, than that are actually serving a court-awarded sentence. It's not unusual for a provincial system to be housing 60% of their population who haven't been sentenced. Clogged courts, delays, backlogs, administration of justice issues, not criminal charges, now account for more than one-fifth of all cases brought before criminal courts in Canada. Remand facilities are overcrowded, violent, and nearly devoid of substantive programs and interventions. And tragic deaths in custody that destroy staff morale, bring grief to communities, and often result in long and costly lawsuits. At the federal level in the past three years, the Correctional Service of Canada has added or retrofitted a total of 2,700 new cells. As we learned from watching the documentary, that's a net increase, though, of about 1,700 cells once you net out the 1,000 cells that were closed at Kingston, Leclerc, and the Regional Treatment Center. But these 2,700 cells were built at over 30 different penitentiary sites across the country for a total cost of about $700 million. Since 2003-04, since I started in my job, expenditures on federal corrections have increased by 72.5%, from about $1.56 billion to nearly $2.7 billion. Last year, the average annual cost of keeping a federal inmate behind bars was just under $110,000 a year, where the average annual cost for incarcerating a woman was nearly double that at over $210,000 per year. By contrast, maintaining an offender in the community is about 70% less than what it costs to keep him or her locked up. On a per capita basis, the federal correctional system is now costing every person in Canada, every man, woman, and child in Canada, over $71 per year to operate. It's a huge investment, and for that level of per capita spending, we should be getting something more than just incapacitation or warehousing. But the trends are not encouraging. Prison conditions highlighted in the state of incarceration continue to deteriorate. We see increased crowding and violence, too much time spent in cells, and decreased contact with the outside world. <clears throat> there is insufficient program capacity, there's a scarcity of meaningful vocational skills training, and more offenders are now serving longer portions of their sentence behind bars before their release. Prison farms have been closed, federal funding for proven reintegration and release programs such as Lifeline and Circles of Support and Accountability have been eliminated and work programs supported through prison industries have been reduced. According to the Auditor General's spring 2015 report, there has been some serious slippage in CSC's mandate to prepare offenders for safe and timely release. The Auditor General found that 65% of offenders in fiscal year ending 2000, uh, March 2014 did not complete their correctional programs before their first eligibility date for parole. So Two-thirds didn't complete their programs in time to be considered 
for parole. Most offenders returned to the community in 2013-14 were released at statutory release rather than through parole. In fact, nearly seven out of 10 releases from penitentiary this year will be statutory releases at their SR date or their warrant expiry date, not as the result of a decision by the parole board. Half of all offenders staying in custody beyond their first parole eligibility date are nevertheless considered to be low risk. So these are individuals we believe can be safely managed in the community, but they never get an opportunity to present release plans to the parole board. As the Auditor General concluded, and as my office can confirm, the slowing rate of offenders return to the community is leading to higher and avoidable custody costs without a measurable contribution to community safety. The climate inside our federal institutions is troubling. Over the past decade, the number of use of force incidents have almost doubled. Admission to ad admissions to administrative segregation have increased by over 15%. Incidents of prison self-injury have tripled, and involuntary transfers have increased by nearly half. Inmate assaults have doubled. In a series of policy and legislative reforms presented as steps to make offenders more accountable, federal inmates are increasingly bearing more of the direct costs to keep themselves clothed, fed, housed, and cared for. Holding offenders to account now means that they are expected to pay more for their room and board, telephone use, canteen goods, and some over-the-counter medications. And remember, they pay these costs from daily living allowances that haven't been increased since 1981. It's little wonder that offenders return to the community with little or no financial resources to assist in their transition. Long-standing correctional principles, such as the concept of least restrictive measures, have become replaced with more punitive or ambiguous language. Legal principles that were once reserved for sentencing, such as considering the nature and gravity of the offense or the degree of responsibility of the offender, have crept into the federal law governing how sentences are to be administered. The concept of inmate privileges has been dropped from correctional law altogether. Instead of being the outcome of a well-functioning system, public safety has replaced all other principles as the dominant principle guiding corrections. This overshadows equally important and balancing principles such as rehabilitation or reintegration. Changes in legal principle and purpose are not merely rhetorical exercises. They have consequential impacts on how offenders are managed in correctional facilities, including when or even if they appear before the parole board. The mechanisms and systems used to assess risk and eligibility for release uh, of all sorts, work releases, temporary absences, compassionate releases, day or full parole, have become much more restricted. Today, there is a little tolerance for even well managed risk. Just as the United States retreats from its long and ineffective war on crime in this country, we appear to be repeating some costly mistakes. There has been a rapid expansion of mandatory minimum penalties for a series of both minor and major offenses. Criteria for indeterminate sentences, including dangerous offender and long-term supervision order designations, have been expanded, capturing a wider range of offenders. Meantime, Parole eligibility for certain offenses has been gradually tightened or eliminated entirely. Even the process for obtaining a pardon, now called a record suspension, has become more difficult, more lengthy, and more expensive. The results of all this are predictable. More offenders serving more of their sentence behind bars rather than being supervised in the community. This reduction in supervised release may actually serve to increase public risk rather than diminish it. A number of recent legislative measures are being contested or settled in our courts, challenged on procedural fairness and charter grounds. The list of successful legal challenges is long. The retroactive uh, abolition of accelerated parole review, uh, changes in how time served in pretrial custody are calculated, mandatory minimum penalties for gun crime, 
the mandatory imposition of the victim surcharge. These have all been ruled on by superior and appeal courts. And there are, as we speak, a number of actions regarding the use of administrative segregation in federal prisons that are now winding their way through the court process. In fact, there's been so much activity in the courts that the Supreme Court of Canada recently ruled that federal prisoners must have access to provincial superior courts instead of having to rely simply on the federal courts to pursue some of these challenges. As conditions of detention deteriorate, I fully expect to see more offenders seeking relief through the courts. Other legislative proposals that were before Parliament prior to the election call, such as Bill C-53, the Life Means Life Act, or Bill C-56, the Statutory Release Reform Act, could have an impact on average sentence length and time served behind bars should they ever be enacted. For example, the Life Means Life Act proposed to amend the criminal code to introduce a mandatory life sentence without parole for some first degree murder offenses. In introducing this bill, the Attorney General of Canada stated that its intent was to ensure that the most violent offenders in this country, quote, take their last breath behind bars, end quote. Life without parole is an exclusively retributive measure. It denies the offender even the possibility or the capacity for remorse, reform, or release. The possible introduction of the Life Means Life Act would mean the same thing here as it does elsewhere, a living death sentence that exacerbates the physical and the psychic pain of incarceration. The message that it would send to the correctional authority is chilling. This person is disposable. Don't even think about trying to rehabilitate. In the environment and conditions that I have described, I believe that independent oversight and external monitoring of prisons becomes more, not less important. Federal penitentiaries are managing some very complex populations. Though never intended to serve as psychiatric, palliative, or long-term care facilities, they are under increasing pressure to perform these functions on a routine basis. We know from experience that sentenced individuals have the best chance of success upon release when they have been treated fairly, when they have had access to programs and interventions that are matched to their need and risk, and when these supports are delivered by the right people at the right time throughout the sentence. Graduated and structured release is more successful than releasing an offender directly from prison to the street with limited or no period of support. There needs to be better integration of prison and community interventions. Continuums of support and care are required. Now, this situation is not without hope. Um, the Correctional Service of Canada is a large, professional, diverse organization. Um, 15,000 sentenced offenders, another um, eight or 9,000 being supervised in parole. The workforce of the Correctional Service of Canada is about 18,000 men and women. And so there are thousands and thousands of helpful, supportive, lawful, appropriate interactions every day that are in fact contributing to community safety. Um, the issues that I've raised tonight are where we need to do better. And my office has raised, has, has issued many recommendations that I think would improve matters. For example, we've recommended that we should prohibit long-term segregation of mentally disordered, suicidal, or self-injurious offenders. That we should develop an older offender strategic plan. We should appoint a patient advocate to serve at each of the five regional treatment centers operated by the Correctional Service of Canada. These are forensic psychiatric facilities dual designated as hospitals and penitentiaries. We should establish a national forum to lead death in custody prevention efforts. We should appoint a deputy commissioner for Aboriginal corrections. And we need to renew the focus on community reintegration and offender rehabilitation. Now, now, now while not all of these recommendations have been positively received, I am hopeful that progress can be made on some of these files. I want to conclude with just a couple of quick thoughts about where I believe we should concentrate our efforts. No surprise, prevention, rehabilitation, and safe and timely reintegration. Research tells us that early prevention and intervention programs for young 
for youth and young adults with multiple risk factors have the potential to yield considerable savings through reduced conflict with the law over the long term. We need to leverage what we know. Preventing crime through social development works. Early intervention and working with vulnerable families works. We need more initiatives like those undertaken by the Waterloo Council, not less. If a crime is committed, why not engage the broader community in response, much like your Smart on Crime approach does? A recent evaluation of Smart on Crime reported that it has exceeded expectations in many areas. Now, while challenges remain, it's clear that the direction and goals of this program are making a significant contribution to the health of this community. Corrections can learn from this experience. Prisons should place more emphasis on release preparation and building bridges to the community. Strong links with other service providers and safe community stakeholders can only assist the correctional service to achieve its mission. Crime is not just a criminal justice system issue. Collaboration and durable partnerships between justice and community-based organizations are essential in preventing crime in the first instance and in reducing recidivism of offenders once returned to their communities. Health services, substance abuse prevention and drug treatment programs, education, social services, vocational training, you know the list, employment assistant and housing, they all contribute to safe and sound communities. Programs and services must be integrated, built upon the knowledge of what works and use established best practices. As you all know, this is not about being hard or soft on crime, but it's about being smart. Thank you all for the opportunity to meet with you this evening. Um, thank you for the work that you do. I wish you continued success.